Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service here from the Woodbank Community Church in Whitehaven, Cumbria. Uh, welcome this morning. If you're new, uh, a very good welcome to you and it's lovely to have you with us. Uh, we are now an international body, uh, even though we're up on one of the estates on the hills in Whitehaven, if you know the area. Uh, we have come this morning to worship God and to praise him. Uh, I've got uh, Pauline who's going to be doing our reading this morning from the book of Galatians and Des and Kath are going to be preaching. Can I just say that uh, next week we shall be doing a communion service. So if you make sure that uh, you are ready for that next week, we shall, uh, we shall share communion together, which will be really very special. Uh, we thank God for his hand upon us all and we continue to pray for all those who we care for. But first, I'm going to ask Pauline if she would come and she would read to us. And then we're going to have a song and then we'll have Des and Kath praying and then I'll be back later. Okay, enjoy the service this morning. We're going to read from Galatians 5, 16 to 25. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. <laughs> God in my 
Psalm 24 says, So wake up, you living gateways. Lift up your heads, you ageless doors of destiny. Welcome the King of glory, for he is about to come through you. Jesus is at the threshold. Lord, you are about to return. We read in Isaiah 52, Awake, awake, clothe yourself in strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments. Father, as we think about your imminent return, I ask you to wake us up. Father, we think we are awake, but we do not realise that we have been asleep until we have woken up. Jesus, I ask that you would awaken those areas in our lives where we are still asleep, those areas that have gathered dust. As it says in Isaiah 52 verse 2, that we would shake ourselves and rise up and clothe ourselves in holy garments of the priests and kings that we are, living holy lives. That we would be like the wise virgins, with our lamps full of oil, ready for your return, our coming Bridegroom King. Amen. Morning, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day and every day you give us, especially in the light of the world situations. We ask for your grace and favour and forgive us for the way we turn our back on you. We ask that you will heal our land. We ask that wherever your word goes out this day, it will be received and affect many and change lives for good. I also pray for the protection of the children going to school. They will grow up with a knowledge of you, having hope and feeling secure. And now, Lord, I ask you to bless this service as we continue to worship you. Amen. If you remember last week, we were looking at the idea of us being a new creation. And we spoke about it, uh, about its effect on our inner train. I've been thinking about that uh, illustration during the week. And I, I think if I ever wrote a book, I'd call it Your Inner Train. The content probably would be completely boring, but the title just uh, caught my imagination. We saw last week that things really dramatically changed the moment we gave our lives to Jesus. We look back at Genesis 3 and the original fall, and we saw the way in which Eve was tempted and the way she looked at it, and how the moment she fell, something dramatically changed in hers and Adam's life because he followed her. We called it the inner train. We saw that God created us with an engine out the front, which was our spirit within us. And that spirit was connected to the spirit of God. And that pulled along our minds, our way of thinking, and our bodies, our desires. But at that point when Eve sinned, it dramatically changed because her spirit died within her. And it moved to the back, being dragged along. And what took over was the bodily desires and the mind. And that's the way human beings have been ever since. But when we are forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ and the work on the cross, something dramatic happens. Remember, we talked about it being uh, a new creation. The spirit within us comes alive the train turns round again and the spirit leads the mind and the body and that's where we got it from uh, last week now this week before we go to the that reading that Pauline gave us uh, from the book of Galatians uh, a, a book a letter by Paul to the Galatian churches I want to go and have a look at a letter by John and it's John, uh, 1 John chapter 2. And in 1 John chapter 2, all that we learnt last week um, kind of comes into uh, a different form. But it's the same thing. And I hope it will help us to understand something of the change that's happened and John's call to us to actually do something with it. We read from verse 15 in the second chapter, the first letter of John, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he 
says, for all that is in the world, and then gives us three illustrations. But I want to look at the two words before we get into that bit. The first word is love, and the second word is, uh, word is world. Now the word love there is the word that's used of the love of God in John 3.16, agapoi. And yet in this sense, it is used in its classical Greek way of thinking. And uh, let me just give you a definition of that. It's a fondness and affection not affected by morality, of an object for its value. It's looking at something for it as, as, as we value it. And uh, you can look at things uh, positively and, and in a good way and value them and you have a certain response from within. Or you can do it negatively, sinfully. Uh, a passionate desire. We're going to see the word lust coming up in a little while. Uh, lusting for things. It's a, that, very different, but the actual definition is the same. But the word world there, do not love the world, is uh, the word cosmos, um, which we have in, in, in a different context in, in the English language, of course. But I want to read to you a definition that I found of this word cosmos, the world. Because we would look at that word world and think, well, it's, it, it's, it's a planet. It's, it's the trees and the, and the oceans and, and the animals and everything else. But that's not what it means here. The word means the sum total of the human life in the ordered world considered apart from, alienated from, and hostile to God and of the earthly things that seduce us from God, a system where Satan is head. Very different to our physical world. But what John is trying to say is, look, if you love the world, that definition, cosmos, then the love of the Father can't be in you. Love can only go in one direction. You love the world, you love God. And that's the picture. And then what he does is he looks at three illustrations of that. And we find them here. It says, the desire of the flesh. The desires of the flesh is one way of looking at the world and our reaction to the world. And it means lust or cravings or passionate desires. If you passionately desire or lust the flesh, and the flesh is the word that means the totally depraved nature as governed, uh, governing an individual's reason, will, and emotion. So it's the stuff that came in after the fall. And that's the first thing. The second thing is the desires or lust of the eyes. That's the second thing that comes out of a love for the world. And that means the passionate cravings of the eyes for satisfaction, cravings that come from our evil nature. That's the second thing. You can see more and more why love of God is not linked with this at all. And the third thing is the pride of life. And that means originally empty swagger or insolent talk. A vain assurance of our own resources, not of God's. Now, if you look at that passage and then you look back at Genesis 3, you see that those are the three things that affected Eve. Uh, and you see it in a slightly different language in Genesis. But it's the way in which the whole thing works. This falling into the things of the world. And the things of the world, again, are not the things of God. The things of the world pre, uh, preclude God. They don't allow God in. They are the things we want to do so that God has no control over us. And that's the situation. These all come from the cosmos, the not God. Now, Paul in Ephesians 2 says this, you were dead in all these things, you used to live in the passion of your flesh, 
carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, separated from God, awaiting his judgment. And that's where Adam and Eve got us to, but we have stayed in it since then. So, John warns us not to love the world, but to love God. And that's very important. Now, Paul also talks in Romans 8 about this, and I'd just like to read that to you. It says, talks of us as being those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Now, I'm ever so sorry, but John knew, uh, Paul rather knew nothing about trains. I'm sure he would have used my train illustration if he'd have known about trains, but they weren't invented then. But he's saying the same thing. He's saying there's two ways to walk. Now that we are a new creation, there is a new way of walking, and that is by the Spirit. Train, have the train as the engine, uh, have the, uh, the engine as the spirit, not the body and mind. It's turning around and going back to the way in which we originally were meant to go. So there's two ways to walk. Let's go back to Paul's illustration. We can walk in the flesh or we can walk in the spirit. And what John is really telling us and what Paul is also telling us is that we in our new creation lives need to make sure that we are walking according to the Spirit. That is an emphasis, that is an activity that we need to be a part of. In our lives, we need to actively stop walking in the fleshly ways we used to before we knew Christ and start discovering how to walk in the Spirit of God. And now we come to Galatians chapter 6. In that passage in Galatians uh, 5, rather, uh, that Pauline talked, uh, talked about earlier with the reading, there are some things that it says about the Spirit, and I've added one from chapter 6, verse 8. So let's quickly look at them. In verse 16 it says, But I say, walk by the Spirit. Now that literally means conducting yourselves by the Spirit. The way you order things deliberately is by the Spirit of God, the Spirit's ways. The second one we find in verse 18. It says, be led by the Spirit. To be led by the Spirit. Checking every wrong desire according to that which comes from the Spirit. So it means that if we are tempted, we check it out with the Spirit. And then we react the way the Spirit would have us react. Uh, as a very interesting example of this, probably the best one in Scripture, is the temptations of Christ. Because when he was tempted by the devil, uh, the first thing he basically said is, it is written. In other words, the Holy Spirit guided him to what had been written in Scripture, and that's the way he reacted to it. And we need to learn to do that. We need to learn to react through the Word of God and allow the Spirit to bring that Word into our thinking so that we can, instead of just doing it and then being upset later, we actually challenge it with what the Spirit says. The third thing we find is we, we are to live by the Spirit. Verse 25, and to live by or with reference to the Holy Spirit in that our new divine life in, a, in us was supplied by the Spirit, he has the instructions. So live by his instructions. Uh, and there, there is that idea of living by the Spirit. And then there's keep in step with the Spirit. Again, verse 25, walk in a straight line. That means literally, walk in a straight line with the Spirit. Conduct yourselves rightly. Live our lives under the guidance, impulses and energy that come from the Spirit. And friends, we can't do this on our own. And so we really need to get to know the Holy Spirit. And we need to live His way. 
uh, as we grow in our faith. And then that little one that I've added in chapter 6, verse 8, tells us to sow to the Spirit. That's a, an interesting concept because what, John, what uh, Paul does is he, he says, uh, we could sow to the flesh, but if we sow to the flesh, we reap corruption. In other words, if we follow the ways of the flesh, it corrupts us. And if we keep doing it, we get more and more corrupted and more and more separated from God. And you and I have done this. We've gone through periods where we have just not walked properly with God. We've gone our own way. And my goodness, we've walked a long way and we've changed. We've changed. Our spiritual life has changed. It's dulled. He says, so to the spirit and you'll reap eternal life. The more we sow into our walk with the Holy Spirit, the more of eternity changes this life within us on earth, and the more like Jesus we become. An active faith. And that's what we need to do as we want to grow up in our new creation. Because we now have the, our spirit at the front, we need to really connect it to the Holy Spirit as much as possible. And then the old ways of the flesh become less and less powerful in our lives. And friends, that's the conclusion, really. We need to specifically choose the way of the Spirit as Christians. You can't just give your life to Jesus and then get on with life in the old way. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. One wonders if you're ever saved. What we need to do is to deliberately go with the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, we can't talk about that this time, but next time we're going to uh, uh, start looking at the Holy Spirit and who he is and what he does in us and through us. So we shall enjoy having a go at that next week. Don't forget that next week we'll be having communion together. But as we close, let's just pray. Lord, uh, we pray, send your Holy Spirit into our lives, that our walk would be closely with him, that we would live according to the Spirit. And in doing so, Lord, your very uh, ways and, uh, and your, your uh, instructions to us will become more and more real. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. See you next week.